1825, the Zor settlement was eight years old, so communal lifestyle under the Society of Separatist Articles of Association had taken root, and the inhabitants were successfully providing for themselves. Crops of wheat, oats and rye were growing in the fields. A large grain mill was built along the river to produce flour for baked goods. Orchards, vineyards and gardens were yielding enough produce that the excess was being sold to surrounding farms and communities. There was an adequate supply of meat from a fine herd of beef cattle. The dairy herd provided a daily supply of fresh milk, which the women used to make butter and cheese for the settlement and for export. The resourcefulness of the German separatists was apparent. They were a people who seized opportunity and learned to profit from it. And soon another opportunity would come their way that would make the society debt-free and would open their closed community to the outside world. Ohio had to do something. Its fragile agriculture-based economy was failing, due in large part to the lack of cost-efficient means for farmers to ship their grains and other goods to the larger towns and cities in the state and to markets to the east. By 1825, Ohio had gone from being a frontier full of promise to the poorest state in the country. Amid a swirl of controversy and doubt, Governor Ethan Allen Brown and his successor Alan Trimble were able to convince the legislature and the public that digging a canal that would join Lake Erie at Cleveland and the Ohio River at Portsmouth would be the answer. So on July 4, 1825, on the Licking Summit at Heath, Ohio, the first shovel full of dirt was turned and construction of the 308-mile Ohio Erie Canal began. The canal was built through the Cuyahoga, Tuscarawas, and Muskegon River Valleys to use the rivers as a water source. Construction was financed through the sale of public lands. The cost to build the Ohio and Erie Canal was $10,000 per mile. When they learned that the canal would pass along the western edge of Zor, Josef Bimler and the separatist other leaders realized this was an opportunity to pay off the $16,000 land debt the society owed to Philadelphia businessman Gottfried Hager. So the separatists contracted with the state of Ohio to build a seven-mile stretch of the canal through their land for nearly $23,000. Everyone who could be spared from his or her daily duties in the settlement worked to dig the canal. Tons of earth and rock were removed, the men digging with picks, shovels, and at times their hands, and the women hauling away the dirt in tubs carried atop their heads, in large wheelbarrows or in their aprons. In addition, the Society of Separatists built one canal lock, number 10, as well as a guard lock on the Tuscarawas River that allowed entry into the Zor feeder and side cut canals. The feeder provided compensatory water to the canal. The side cut created a branch of the canal to Zor. An extension of a six story grain mill was built over the Ohio Erie and side cut canals. This huge extension allowed four canal boats to be loaded at once. By 1832, the canal was completed in its entire length with a total of 152 locks, each 15 feet wide or 90 feet long between the upper and lower gates. 15 of the locks were located in Tuscarawas County. The towing bank or tow path was 10 feet wide and the opposite berm or heel path was 6 feet wide. To lock through, boats would enter the lock chamber, the gates would close and the water level raised or lowered depending on the boat's direction. The standard crew on a canal boat consisted of five people. A captain, steersman, bowsman, driver who drove the hitched horse team on the towpath and a cook. The boats ran day and night, but were idled in the winter when the canal waters were frozen. The Ohio Erie Canal, the ditch that brought the world to the wilderness, as it was called, soon brought the prosperity its supporters had envisioned. It transformed Zor and nearby Bolivar into bustling shipping ports. The canals proved to be such a success that private investors began building other canal systems throughout the state. One of those was the Stanley Beaver Canal, which joined the Ohio Erie at Bolivar to the Ohio River at Beaver, Pennsylvania. The canals opened Zor and Bolivar to the outside world. Because it became easier to transport goods to markets using the canals, shipping costs dropped and profits rose. The Society of Separatists only operated three canal boats, the Friendship, Economy, and Industry. The boats carried dairy products, produce, iron stoves, tinware, and leather products to Cleveland, Portsmouth, and beyond, to the larger cities of the East. 
Large warehouses were built in Bolivar, and the populations of both communities began to grow. Travelers and canal workers needed a place to stay, so in 1829 the separatists constructed a hotel, the Canal Hotel, on a hillside overlooking the canal. The building still stands and today is known as the Inn on the River. The quaint atmosphere of the village and the hospitality of the separatists also made Zor a popular tourist attraction along the Ohio Erie Canal. The separatists capitalized on this opportunity by constructing a large hotel and a general store on Main Street. The hotel gained a reputation among travelers for its delicious food and clean rooms. The Zor Hotel catered to all people, from millionaires to beggars. Zor also became a romantic destination. In the summertime, the area's natural beauty was enjoyed on long walks and carriage rides. Rowboats could be rented along the river day and night, so lovers could paddle along the quiet water among the water lilies. The economic prosperity brought about the canals reached its peak in 1852, when the value of the separatist property was valued at a million dollars. A year later, Zor's founder and spiritual leader, Josef Bimler, died and the worldly forces began to erode the bonds that held the separatists together. Divisions among the members arose. Charges were made that the separatists working at the Zor Hotel were being treated better than others. An outsider, Alexander Gunn of Cleveland, was allowed to buy a cabin in the village and decided to make it his permanent residence. The younger members of the society became disillusioned with communal living. By 1898, Conditions had deteriorated to the point where the trustees decided to dissolve the Society of Separatists of Zor and divide the assets among the members. Railroads and extensive damage from the Great Flood of 1913 ended Ohio's canal era. Today, remnants of those golden times still exist. A towpath trail a short distance from here allows you to explore the ruins of Lock 10 as well as the remains of a fish hatchery built there in 1921 by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. You can follow the towpath trail to Fort Lawrence State Memorial in Bolivar. Along the way, you'll see the remains of the Ohio Erie Locks 9, 8, and 7. On the surface, it appears that the Ohio Erie Canal brought about the demise of the communal settlement of Zor. But history allows us to put their efforts into perspective and realize the canal played a key role in transforming the Ohio frontier into the land of opportunity it is today.